tuned in to the Community Cats Podcast. Ready? Let's go. Welcome to the Community Cats Podcast. I'm your host, Stacey LeBaron. I've been involved helping homeless cats for over 20 years with the Merrimack River Feline Rescue Society. The goal of this podcast is to expose you to amazing people who are improving the lives of cats. I hope these interviews will help you learn how to turn your passion for cats into action. And I am so excited that today we have an incredible guest from Fresno, and her name is Brandy Sherman, and she is with Fresno TNR, which is run by a handful of volunteers dedicated to filling every possible spay and neuter appointment that they are given. Working with other rescues to rehome cats or kittens that are friendly but dropped off in colonies. With a full-time job in the medical field, Brandy spends all of her free time invested in making community cats safe and sterile. Fresno TNR's purpose is to alleviate suffering in the feral cat population by means of education and TNR. Their intent is to be available when possible to assist individuals and businesses with sterilization for community and domestic cats. Brandy, I'd like to welcome you to the show. Thank you very much. Before we jump into all this great information and finding out more about what's going on with Fresno TNR, how did you become so passionate about cats? Well, I grew up as a country girl and we had many cats around our house. Having kittens left and right, I really don't know. None of them ever really lived their life out. So as a child, I kind of understood that there was something a little bit wrong with that. And as an adult, I decided that I had wanted to be a vet tech, but that's pretty much where it came from was the suffering that I saw as a child and the cats that we had around our home. Mm. Many of us have these aha moments. I had a situation where I went up and looked at some cats. I was told, you know, there were a few cats behind a bar that I really should do something with them. Something needed to be done with those few cats behind the bar. And so I'm like, okay, I trundle up there thinking, oh, few, doesn't a few mean like three? And it was actually like 35 kittens living in this dumpster with like twice as much broken glass as the number of kittens that were there all around the dumpster. And all the kittens had goopy eyes and many of them shut closed. And there were all these adult cats looking at me from the woods because they had run away when I came up and I'm looking in the woods behind the apartment complex. I'm looking at the bar. I'm looking at the dumpster. I'm looking at the kittens. I'm looking at the glass and I'm going, yeah, this is not a picture I want to ever see again. And I don't think anyone else would want to see this picture. So it sounds like you had a bit of that kind of a moment too. Yes, it was devastating as a child, but you know, what do you know when you're a kid? It just didn't seem right. Right. Yeah, definitely. Talking about being a kid, you have experience in the medical field. Tell me about how and when you started Fresno TNR or were you involved in the animal welfare space or the community cat space before you started this group? As a teenager, after graduating high school, we had caught a few cats on our patio and fixed them. And then going out into the real world, I decided that I wanted to be a veterinary technician. So I did go to school for that and ended up working at the California Feline Foundation at the time. I had a great opportunity there. It was pretty eye-opening to the rescue community. So it started fostering, of course, where we all start fostering bottle babies, mostly. And then once in a while, something would come along and I would do something. You know, you get married, you get sidetracked, you take in a few and you foster those But once I got divorced, I felt like I needed to do more with my life. So I jumped in the deep end, did some rescuing with a a group called Cats by the Tracks. From there, I could tell that there was just not enough out there for the community cat, the feral cats. It was more just trying to rescue what was already out there. What were we doing to stop this? We weren't doing anything. We were trying to rescue our way out, which is never going to happen. So with somebody else, we started a group. That didn't pan out so well. So I decided to go on my own with one of the guys that we had been working with. In November 2022, we decided to do Fresno TNR. So for the past year, we've been running our own rescue. I understand Fresno TNR. It says you're supportive of TNR and and that is your focus. What are the goals of the organization? How do you achieve those goals? And is it solely focused just on trap new to return? Or are there other components? We are solely based on spay and neuter. 
for the feline population. So community cats, anybody's cat, own cats, unknown cats, feral cats, any cat. We will fix any cat except mountain lions, which I've been asked when I was in the mountains with the van. I was like, no, we don't do that. that. That's wildlife. But yes, that's our main goal is to spay and neuter. So we're trying to start at the beginning and end it there. Our goal is to eventually get to a time where we don't see the sick and dying and uncared for unowned cats out in the streets anymore, hopefully. <laughs> so I love to say my definition of a community cat, as you say, can be owned, can be unowned, but four paws on the ground is a community cat. And if there is a cat out there with four paws on the ground that's not spayed or neutered, we're going to spay and neuter that cat. Or sometimes three. <laughs> three paws. We have a three herald. I love him. Yeah. yeah. And lots of cauliflower ears and all that fun stuff, too. So we love our community cats. But I'm wondering, do you believe that there is a way to reduce our community cat population? I certainly 100% do. If we work as a community, we can get there. We really can. It's going to take some time and a lot of effort, a lot of effort. And everybody's going to have to be involved to help get to that point. But yes, we can. We can get there. So what are the strategies that you use to reduce cat overpopulation? Are you targeting your efforts? Are you strictly doing owned cats in some places, doing TNR only in other places? Do you have a specific strategy or are you just saying Fresno is our target area and we're just going to go crazy? Actually, Fresno is where we live, not necessarily our target area. Like I say, anybody that's willing to drive, even if you're from another state, we will help you. If you drive the animals, the cats here to us in Fresno, we will get those cats fixed for you. We don't really have a target. So right now, because I feel like it's such a mess here, we're just trying to reach out to everybody that's willing to help a cat. And we're willing to fix that cat. As a group, Chris, Gilbert, Sydney, Kathy, and Savannah and I, we do do targeted areas when we see something that we really feel like that needs to be done right now. We kind of halt the appointments that we give people and we work on that area. Like we did this Monday, there was three or four different locations, you know, one or two cats or nine cats that we had. We ended up in a parking lot that had over 20 cats and that was new to us. Not a new situation, but that colony was new to us. So we're going to have to come up with a plan. So yeah, as a group, we will work on certain locations that are those feral colonies that nobody's caring for. Most people are willing to work on their colony, which we will work with them and do one or two or 10 when we can. But we also work on ourselves. We work on those cats out there that have nobody taking care of them. Mm -hmm. Right, right. And how are you getting these surgeries funded? The surgeries are funded. We started with Dogwood Animal Rescue Project, and they reached out to me. Charlotte had reached out to me and asked me if I wanted to help here. They knew that Fresno was a target area, essentially. Uh, we like to call it the armpit. And she had asked if I was willing to help them spay and neuter dogs and cats, funded by Dogwood. I was totally up for this. This was probably four or five years ago. It just kind of avalanche into this, can we do TNR? And then I branched off and started doing only cats with that. And then they had another gal do the dog stuff. But that's kind of where it started. And that's kind of where we are right now. It just loomed. And have you been impacted by the veterinary shortage at all and having challenges in finding appointments for spay neuter? It was difficult in the beginning. I don't know if people really realized what our vision was. So... In the beginning, we had a few people on board. Valley Animal Center was one of them. I had worked with those gals 10 years ago. I had a connection with them. SPCA, Central California SPCA, we connected with them. They were giving us some spots, like a few here and there. And then when they started to see what we were doing, it was like, okay, we can give you 20 to 30 spots a day. Then it turned into this, hey, anytime you guys have last minute appointments, people don't show, let us know, we'll fill them. So that was kind of hard to get a grasp on. Like, how do we contact all these people one time to say, hey, we have these appointments. Just run down here within the next hour and we'll get you in. But we did with our Facebook page. We have a group chat where we just go in and we say, hey, look, we have appointments for this many cats. We need boys or girls. Meet us down here within an hour. And these people jump on and they show up and we fill those spots. So 
the veterinarians are super grateful because, of course, when you're not working, you're not making any money. So with that, we're able to fill those spots and help them out. And in turn, they realized what we were doing, what we were trying to accomplish. So they worked with us and allowed us a little more time to bring animals in. But anybody that didn't show up for their appointments, well, I was celebrating it, but at the same time, not understanding why somebody would just not show up for their appointments. But, you know, I guess life happens. Yeah. So don't have to share specifics, but in general, your average price for the surgeries, does it range in the zero to 50 range, 50 to 100, 100 to 150 or over 150 per cat? It's about $60 a cat. That's fair. Yeah. So they'll do the spay, neuter and a rabies vaccine. And then on our own dime, we pay for the FBRCP and everybody gets vaccinated. And are you microchipping or you're definitely ear tipping anybody who's going back outside, but are you doing any microchipping or no at this time? We were about two years ago, we were microchipping everything. It was getting a little costly. And then quite honestly, it was nice. I did have a few cats come back that were actually had turned friendly. One of them had ended up having FIP and I only had him a few days before I lost him and I had even tried to start to treat him, but he got me. I was grateful that I had microchipped them, but realizing, you know, where's our money going to go further and realizing that our new shelter now was telling people to go ahead and take the cats with the ear tips back where they found them or either keeping them and taking them back where they found them, but they were no longer euthanizing them. We felt safe enough that we didn't need to microchip everybody. I know you've only been in operations for about a year's time, but I'd be curious to hear more about what are your measures of success? So when you look back at the past year or so of work that you have done with Fresno TNR, how are you going to determine that your program is as impactful as you have thought about? I mean, at this point in time, the way that behavior in certain shelters are changing They're not necessarily, their statistics of the shelters are not accurately representing what's really happening for cats out in the field. So how have you decided to measure your success? Blood, sweat, and tears. (laughs) Actually, we have not been keeping track of our spay and neuters up until 2023. 2023, we decided to go ahead and keep track. I wouldn't have known how many we did before, but when we counted last year, 6,700, I really feel that is impactful. That is impactful. Some of the shelters that I work with have told me this past summer, it didn't feel like there were as many. 6,700 probably dropped in the bucket to what we have out there, but it's got to have some impact. Right. It's something which is better than nothing. Some of the different metrics that have been used in other communities have been working with your DPW and finding out how many hit by car cats are picked up or how many passed away cats and kittens are picked up if they are picked up. Complaint calls into the municipality for cats, that usually changes pretty substantially when you have a really aggressive, high volume, targeted spay-neuter program. And I understand you may not be that targeted because you're helping from probably a wider radius, but yet you still may have some of those factors as you continue each year, you'll see, oh, I'm getting more calls from this area versus this area and get a better sense of what's going on in in the region versus just looking at the shelter intake numbers and going with that. And for sure, also the lowest income communities in your area are going to be the ones that are going to have the higher volume. As your income level goes down, the number of cats you have go up. So there's definitely a desire to focus a lot of those spay neuter resources in those communities to make a significant impact on our problems. We all believe, you know, a spay here has the same impact as the spay over here in a different community, but it may not necessarily be the case. And I know you have had a program where you've done just a neuter only situation. Can you tell me the history around that program? Central California SPCA had an idea. Let's do 100 boy cats in one day. I was a little nervous and hesitant, but I said, okay, because, you know, 100 cats. Sure, why not? We can figure this out. So we did a couple of those and we were finding that we were getting way beyond 100 cats that we needed to spay or neuter. So next, I think it was the third event we were going to do. It was like 150 cats. And I was like, okay, 
So I was explaining to Kyle Kirkland, who runs Kirkland Foundation, oh, we, we're doing this neuter event and we're getting a lot more people wanting to neuter their cats than we're getting appointments. Oh, he had this great idea. Let me talk to my vet. Let's see what we could do. So that ballooned into some open offer to drop cats off one day and neuter the cats the next day. Um, I wasn't really sure what was going to happen. And quite honestly, that was probably one of the most sleepless nights I've ever had in my life because I didn't know how this was going to work. This is the first time we'd done this. So we had all our volunteers lined up. Quite frankly, if we didn't have them, I know we could not have done this. We have so many volunteers that were amazing and showed up for all three days, drop off, neuter day, and pickup day. It was awesome. So the first one we did, we ended up getting 407 cats in. And I was a little floored, but it worked. And then we did a few more after that. And every time we did it, we got a little better at organizing it. Things that we needed to do, things that we needed to change, the way we needed to change them up. So the first one, September 13th, was 407 surgeries. We did 389 neuters and 18 spays. Because, of course, when somebody brings a cat in a trap and they don't know how to sex them, well, I'm not going to turn away a female cat just to be released back into the colony because... I can't do that. I can't live with that. So we did advertise it as neuter only event quietly. We took in the girls, didn't divulge that information to people because we didn't want people just bring in their females. The next event we did October 18th, we did 361 surgeries. 332 of those were neuters and 19 were spays. October 25th, we did it again. We did 416 surgeries. We did 365 neuters. And we did 51 spays. The spays keep going up. I think people were starting to catch on to our little loophole, right? And then just to throw it out at the end of the year, we did another one on November 3rd and we did 339 surgeries, 270 neuters, and 69 spays. It was a lot more than the last one. So the spays took all the way, I think Tuesday was our intake days and Friday was our pickup days for the last female that got fixed. So it took us three or four days to do all the females because, of course, the surgeries take longer. Right. Right. And this was all done at one spay neuter facility? Yeah. So Kirkland Foundation set this up with Palm Bluff Veterinary Hospital. He owns the whole entire building. At the end of the building, he had an open office space, which was large enough for us to do what we needed to do. And this was probably what made it work the most we had all the cats on the same property. So all we had to do was put the cats on a cart, take them down to the end, drop them off at the veterinary office and have them neuter the cats. And then we would bring them back and then we could sit there and watch the cats recover. Valley Animal Center did take in some spays and neuters as well because Tuesdays are my days with Valley Animal Center. So it was a Tuesday and we sent some off to get fixed over there. Some females, some males. Central California SPCA also did another 100 neuter day with us on one of those and took a hundred cats from them and relieved them of doing that. But working as a collaborative group, we were able to get all of that done within a few days. Are you a proud cat parent looking for the perfect affordable health care for your kitty? Well, look no further than the Community Cat Clinic, conveniently located in Woodstock, Georgia, just north of Atlanta and not too far from the Tennessee and South Carolina borders. The health and happiness of all cats are the top priorities at this feline-only hospital. From preventative care, spay, neuter, and vaccines to specialized and innovative treatments like full mouth dental, ultrasound, radio, iodine therapy, emergency blockage cases, they got your cat's well-being covered. For the TNR community and local shelters, they offer easy-to-access low-cost spay, neuter services and volume appointments. So if you want to do a large TNR project, this is the clinic you want to go to. It's worth the extra trip. Appointments are available most days. Check out the Community Cat Clinic online at communitycatclinic.com or visit them in person at the Walmart Shopping Center at the Shops of Trickham on Highway 92 at Trickham Road in Woodstock, Georgia. More per, less price. Do you need TNR resources to share on demand? We've got you covered. Check out our Everything TNR playlist. Available now on the Community Cats Podcast YouTube channel. This comprehensive playlist includes all of our free webinars presented in partnership with Neighborhood Cats. 
Topics include tips for trappers and colony caregivers, best practices for targeted TNR, return to field programs, and much more. There's something for everyone who wants to help outdoor cats and kittens. Free to stream anytime. Just visit www.communitycats.com slash TNR dash playlist. Want an easy grant opportunity for your animal organization? Maddie's Fund is giving away a $3,000 grant each month to one lucky Maddie's Pet Forum member. You'll automatically be entered to win each month when you start a new discussion, reply to a new post, or upload a new library resource. Learn more at forum.maddiesfund.org today. I'm assuming that this is like batch work at its finest, right? I would assume that even though it was hard and going through this process each time got easier because you knew what to expect, you knew how to plan it out, you know how many people you needed for here and how many people you needed for there, and that if you didn't do these events, you would never have reached the numbers that you did in 2023. Absolutely. And how did the veterinary practices feel about it? Was it energizing to them? I think it was. Homeless Veterinary Hospital is a private veterinary hospital. They're not a low-cost band neuter. I think the text felt overwhelmed as we did that first time, but they got into it. It was a party at the end of the day. Everybody was excited and everybody kept asking numbers. How many have we done? How many do we have left? How many girls are left? It was kind of funny, you know, the veterinarian came down and was going through there and looking, how many do we have left? And he's like, are we almost done? He was excited, very excited about it, as well as the other two vets that work in that office. But there was one Dr. Giuseppe that was absolutely going through there, taking pictures and excited about the work that he was doing. I think it's an absolutely fantastic idea. And you had some owned cats as well as some TNR cats. So there were some cats in carriers and some cats in traps, or was everybody in a trap? Everybody, it was a mix. We had, I believe, a couple of hairless cats show up, the Sphinx. We had a couple of Persians show up. It was kind of interesting to me because it was like, why the pure breeds? Why? But I'm not going to turn anybody down. No judgment. But yeah, it was a mix of both. I think that first event was mostly TNR cats. And if there were other organizations that might be interested in modeling this, would you be willing to be a resource? Absolutely. We wrote up a protocol book just so we could get through this. And every time we did an event, we would change something and make it better. So I think we've fine-tuned it to a point where we don't need to change anything anymore. We've got this. We know what we're doing. We would be able to go to another group and maybe slide them through their first event and show them how we did it, what we did to perfect what we were doing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I almost think, too, there's this uh, concept of uh, batch work. There's also front-loading, where if you want to be impactful in your community, you really need to do a big volume in the beginning. Because if you just do, you know, if you've got a colony of 10 cats or 20 cats and you only do two or three, and then next month you're going to do two or three, the next month, it's really hard to get ahead of the game. And so you do need to do some of this front loading where you need to 50% of the colony. I mean, ideally, it'd be great if you did them all at the same time. But if you can't, for whatever reason, try to do a substantial percentage because you're just going to be swimming against the tide if you aren't doing that. So this provides a great opportunity uh, that uh, also getting all of those atoms, I call them Adam and Eve, and we all want to get Adam neutered, or Adam ends up going outside and finding Eve. So uh, I think that this is an incredible program. And I something very similar, uh, this, or I convinced uh, an organization in Massachusetts to do this back in 2008 and they spent the month of february just offering five dollar neuters for the whole month uh, or as much capacity as their vets could take on because in massachusetts february is a pretty quiet month from an adoption side of things so they did scooters for the public for five dollars from their target areas though they did specific communities that were their higher intake communities and offered that as a benefit to fill in those slots in february to make sure that everybody was at capacity and that spring, they saw a significant action in the number of kittens that came into their facility after doing that program. So there's a lot of different ways I think that you could approach this. Uh, Over time, as you say, each program will get tweaked based on the needs of the community, based on the resources that are available. Are there any reason why you would think an organization would not want to do something like this? 
They're dog lovers. <laughs> I like to say that even people that hate cats, I'm doing you a favor as well. I'm making it so there aren't so many. So you shouldn't be able to hate this from either side. I agree with you. Yeah. It can work 100%. Yeah. There's bird lovers. There's dog lovers. There's all of those. And honestly, spaying and neutering is a benefit to all. And working with your community and your resources. You were talking about private veterinarians and really just trying to collaborate with them in a way that works for their business. So for their business, I would think it would make sense for them to want to do these kinds of events because it's like one and done. It's there. It's a very beginning, middle and end, right? We know this is going to happen. We know this is the money we're going to get. This is what we do. And we're contributing to the community. There's good PR behind it. But it's not like they're dealing with dribbles here, dribbles there. So I think there's great opportunity, especially for veterinarians that might want to be getting more involved in the animal welfare space, but they've been a little bit shy about it. And then they can say, okay, well, this would be my contribution. So it might open the door because I think we do need to have more private practice veterinarians involved with trap neuter return. I think private practice, I honestly don't know if they know that the problem is out there like it is. I know all the low cost span neuters, they know, but private practices are like, is it really a problem? Because I know with Palm Bluff, that was kind of their thing. And they're like, are we almost done? And I'm like, not even close. Not even yeah. close. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Hey, Brandy, if folks are interested in finding out more about Fresno TNR, how would they do that? They can follow us on Facebook or Instagram, Fresno TNR, or they can email us at info at FresnoTNR.org. Super. And is there anything else you'd like to share with our listeners today? Yes. Spay and neuter your cats and vaccinate them. That's important, too. Spay, neuter, and vaccinate your cat. It's very, very important. If you are an organization that feels like they don't have access to veterinary care, what tips would you give them being a veterinary technician yourself? What tips would you give them in approaching a practice that they've never worked with before? I think sometimes when you approach with numbers, that makes an impact with them, whether it be what they're maybe profiting off of doing spay and neuter or what is out here that is happening. You've got to show them the numbers. Then you have to show them what it looks like. Sometimes the pictures send the message more than anything. And it hits a nerve with some people. And I know sometimes I post pictures of cats that are injured or dead on my Facebook page. And that really gets people right where you kind of want to hit them. You know, Uh, this is the reality. This is what it looks like. I know that you want me to shield you from what you see, but this is what I see. This is what I have to deal with. And when you don't see it, you don't know, you're not aware of it. So if you approach them with those as well and show them what's going on in the community with the cats, they're getting sick. They're not healthy. Let's spay and neuter them. It'll make it where what we want it, that maybe they might jump on board and help. Well, that's great. I so totally appreciate what you're doing, what you've started. I've been involved in Trap Neuter Return since 1994. So I am so hopeful that you are going to stay involved in this for 30 plus years like me. Because I know you can make a great impact in Fresno or wherever you are helping cats. So I want to thank you for turning your passion for cats into action. And thank you again for agreeing to be a guest on my show. I hope we'll have you on again in the future. Thank you so much. That's it for this week. Please head over to Apple Podcasts and leave a review. We love to hear what you think. And a five-star review really helps others find the show. You can also join the conversation with listeners, cat caretakers, and me on Facebook and Instagram. And don't forget to hit follow or subscribe on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, YouTube, Stitcher, or wherever you listen to podcasts so you don't miss a single show. Thanks for listening. And thank you for everything that you do to help create a safe and healthy world for cats.